uh, greetings. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Raj once again for giving me this uh, fantastic opportunity uh, to talk about future of endoscopy. And I would like to convey my sincere apologies for not being there due to a health-related issue that I, I had to take care. These are my disclosures. And as part of this disclosure, I would like to share with you that I have never given this talk before. And I had to think through to share with you what is the best message I could come up with. So when you look back, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy is the oldest endoscopy society. A couple of years ago, it celebrated its 75th year. We have come a long way in terms of endoscopy, starting with rigid scopes and a little bit of a semi-flexible uh, tip at the end with the Dr. Schindler, who was the founding member of the American Society for GI Endoscopy. And we all know that we celebrate his legacy with the Schindler Award every year. Thanks to Dr. Basil Hoshevitz, who developed flexible fiber optic endoscopy in 1961. I must say that I had the distinct privilege of interviewing with him while I was looking for my fellowship training spots. I went to see him at the University of Alabama Medical Center uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and I still remember how kind Dr. Basil Hershevitz was during that interview. Fast forwards, 2020, I'm sure Dr. Basil Hershevitz will be very proud of what we have accomplished in gastrointestinal endoscopy. We have come a long way, not only starting with the diagnosis, but also therapy of various gastrointestinal disorders, and recently with the institution of a screening for colorectal cancer, Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer, as well as gastric cancer. In addition, we've come a long way in instituting surveillance protocols for gastrointestinal diseases with a certainly, uh, with, a, with a great impact on both quality of life for patients with gastrointestinal disease as well as increasing their survival. Endoscopy has certainly evolved into a distinct speciality. In the last decade, we have gone beyond the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract into the third space that has increased our ability to manage motility disorders of the gut. We have, we have become good in not only opening up strictures, removing early cancer, managing gastrointestinal bleeding, and also in cutting the muscle and opening up tracts between adjacent loops of bowel and creating anastomosis. In summary, we should be proud of the fact that endoscopy has certainly replaced surgery on many fronts, especially in the early stages of tumor, as well as in pancreatic or biliary diseases. Now, coming to the problem, I was looking uh, through the web, and one disappointing fact is there is a huge scarcity of healthcare providers across the globe. And this graph shows 
the paucity of healthcare care providers in certain parts of Africa, as well as Asia and in South America. Even in the well-developed countries, there is still a struggle for a patient to access medical care promptly and be at peace for be at peace and remain comfortable that he has certainly received the best possible care irrespective of where he lived. So when I think about the problems of endoscopy service, I think about disparity in both access to endoscopy care and also the availability of high quality endoscopy service in any part of the board, including the developed board. So let's look at the challenges in 2020 and beyond for endoscopy. When Raj asked me to give this talk, I had no clue. So I kept thinking during my endoscopy uh, and also uh, during my life as an endoscopist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center and reflect on what problems am I facing, what problems do my patients face uh, so that I could come up with a framework for us to work on. At the MD Anderson Cancer Center, I work as a therapeutic endoscopist with a special interest in managing colon polyps uh, so that we could remove those polyps by endoscopy and avoid the need for surgery. So I would like to present a series of uh, scenarios and pose uh, questions or challenges that I face and I'm sure you probably all face the same challenges. So here is uh, uh, a patient that actually came to see me with a large polyp for resection. Unfortunately, his physician did not refer this gentleman to see me. Instead, he had to go onto the web, Google, search, and find that I could take care of this patient. It's sad in the 20th century or 21st century to have a patient have to struggle and find a physician that could take care of their problem. So this offers an opportunity for us to come up with ways and means to educate physicians as well as patients about the resources that are available to take care of our patients well. So the point is widespread implementation of education. The next challenge is when I take this patient to the endoscopy unit, it's important for us to keep in mind the outcome of any procedure is dependent on a team effort. If one of the team members is a weak link, the outcome is certainly going to be impacted in one way or the other, and we should be able to fix that. One problem that I face is this. Technicians on whom we depend, at least in the United States and most parts of the world, do not have a formal training in endoscopy technology. This is completely different from the surgical technologists who do go to a two-year school before they enter the operating room. Although endoscopy has certainly evolved and made leaps and bounds in what endoscopy could offer, we have forgotten about training the endoscopy technologists. So this is another area that we could focus and develop an endoscopy tech training program so that we have the highest, highly trained endoscopy technicians to help us. 
Another problem that I face is the long waiting list, especially when a particular service is provided by a small group of people. I keep questioning how do I provide prompt, high quality care to so many patients with the large colon polyps. That brings to the question and possible solution about sharing the knowledge to other with others so that patients could be taken care promptly. And I feel that patients should be taken care promptly closer to home and avoid the inconvenience of traveling to a major center for care. Another major challenge is I ask myself, how do I keep up with endoscopy screening load while I'm aging and my joints are hurting? This brings us to this important question, how do as physicians and endoscopists keep ourselves in good physical condition and practice ergonomically safe techniques so that we could serve our patients for a long time into the future. We take pride that endoscopy has replaced surgery, but a surgeon does spend a lot of his education, starting with medical school along with, the, with most of us who start together but they take a different path to offer surgical training as endoscopy is replacing surgery. Should we not embrace highly skilled surgeons and offer them training in endoscopy so that there is a lot more workforce available to take care of patients with gastrointestinal diseases? Another challenge is I keep thinking about how do I help my endoscopy colleagues in certain parts of the world who have difficulty in accessing uh, high quality education material to help their patients? And uh, this could be made easy. This could be easily done if we all take initiative to share our knowledge on the web in an open access form. So these are some of the challenges that I keep thinking and wondering whether how to fix them. Coming to the future of endoscopy, I do not believe that more technology is going to fix it. That is my humble opinion. I feel that education and training should be the top priority in 2020 and onwards so that we could offer both cognitive skills and technical skills involved in endoscopy so that a large group of endoscopists could provide that service to patients with gastrointestinal disorders. If you look back, this is how we have trained over the last 30, 40 years. One-on-one -on -one mentorship, going to live courses, maybe watching video library. And I believe that video GIE that was started by the ASGE offers an open access platform to help people from anywhere in the world. And uh, this is the first edition uh, that came out in 2016 and the journal is doing very well. We could use gastrointestinal endoscopy, the video GIE, as a tool to educate our patients because it's available on the web. And if you're planning to do a procedure, the patient could go and look at a particular procedure and learn about it. We could also use video GIE to help our colleagues if they face a difficult, challenging problem they could refer to video GIE and be able to fix it. It's also possible for video GIE as a journal offer 
exposure to different techniques for physicians with busy practice without the need to leave their practice. This can be done in the comfort of their sofa. The cases offer a wide variety that could be used by panel for discussion. So, the open access educational platform, whether it's Video GIE or some other journal, would fill the cognitive aspects of endoscopy and its needs. Coming to the technical skills, the key is for us to invest in simulation and training. One important thing that I believe strongly is the development of workforce, a competent workforce, not only just endoscopists that go through medical school, but endoscopy nurses that could become similar to the certified registered nurse anesthetist. You could have certified registered nurse endoscopists who could take care of the huge screening load that we have difficulty taking care and also train technicians similar to surgical techs. I'm delighted to share with you that the Houston Community College in the midst of the Texas Medical Center is planning to start a dedicated endoscopy tech training program in 2020. I would like to bring best wishes from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center and I want to thank you all for this great opportunity. Thank you.